What is the dumbest solution to a problem that actually worked? Story 1. A few years ago, I worked at a U.S. Airways contract where a lot of the baggage handlers were guys fresh out of high school. Picture in your mind the assortment of rapscallions and buffoons that you hung out with at that age. Now put that rambunctious crew in charge of a bunch of airplanes. Those are the characters in this story. One day, two of them were playfully wrestling each other in the break room. It quickly came to an end when one guy got slammed into the wall and left a huge, human-sized dent in the drywall. It was a weekend, so management wasn't around, which meant they had to hide the damage in order to escape punishment. The wall they dented had a rather large, old cork board on it. The cork board was probably 5 feet tall and 8 feet long and had clearly been affixed to the wall for years. They decided to move the cork board to cover the hole. Now, if you saw the setup of the room, you'd know this was the dumbest solution you could dream up. The cork board was centered on the wall with a few feet of blank wall space on both the left and right sides. But the dent was all the way to the right of the wall, in the empty wall space between the cork board and the main entrance. To move the cork board to cover the hole, they had to shift it down and to the right a few feet, not inches, feet. The repositioned cork board almost covered the light switch and exposed a giant white imprint of where the cork board used to be. If Stevie Wonder walked into that room, he'd say, someone has clearly moved that cork board. Monday comes and goes, and no one in charge notices that the cork board had been moved. We were on the second shift, so we assumed when we showed up there would be lots of questions. But there were none. It was business as usual. It wasn't until a few weeks later that management noticed. But at that point, they had no way of telling when it happened. They couldn't tell if the first shift did it or the second if it had happened on a Sunday or a Wednesday, in May or June. They asked around a lot, and I think they even had a general idea of who was probably involved. We all really hated the manager, so it was pretty satisfying to see him come up with nothing when his boss told him to solve the mystery of the human-sized hole. I honestly expected that they were going to move the corkboard and find another hole already behind it. Story 2 my first vehicle was a 1985 Dodge Ram that had around 300,000 miles on it. Needless to say, it wasn't exactly reliable. Anyway, my friend and I had tickets to go see a concert in a city that was about three hours away. We made it there just fine and had a blast at the concert. We couldn't afford to stay overnight, so we started on the long journey home. If all went well, we would get home around 3 a.m. There was one stretch of highway where there was 60-ish miles between towns, it's pretty much the worst place to break down on that journey. There were big signs warning travelers to fill up with gas before leaving town. But I had half a tank. My truck sputtered out and died almost halfway between the two towns. It sure sounded like I ran out of gas, but the gauge still showed half a tank. All had not gone well. So there we were, 1.45 a.m., stuck on the side of the highway in Texas, 30 miles from the nearest towns, no moonlight, and this was before teenagers had cell phones. We were screwed. After a bit of poking around with a flashlight, we discovered that we did have fuel, but the fuel pump had died. We decided to sleep in the truck and mess with it in the morning. On those old Dodge trucks, the fuel pump was inside the engine instead of in the fuel tank like a modern vehicle. It was powered by the engine instead of an electric motor. Essentially, the fuel pump would constantly pump gasoline when the engine was running and gas would always be available for the carburetor float valve. The extra pumped gas would just go back into the gas tank. It was just drifting off to sleep when I was getting an idea. I worked for almost an hour in the pitch dark. I used some extra hose from an agricultural fertilizer, a drink straw, screw clamps, and duct tape to rig the windshield fluid pump to pump fuel from the fuel line into the carburetor float line. I got in my truck, hit the windshield fluid lever, and the truck started right up. It took a bit of trial and error, but I was able to get the timing down where I knew how often to hit the lever to keep the truck running. We made it back home just after 4.30 a.m. My dad wasn't immediately amused with my handiwork, but he told all of his friends how clever his son was, so I guess it passed the dad test. Story 3. I played World of Warcraft back in college. A new expansion came out, and I was supposed to receive my copy via overnight shipping on release day. I checked the tracking number, and it said it was delivered— so I went to check my mailbox. Nothing there other than some junk mail. Talked to the lady at the mailroom, and she said she sorted all the packages for the day, so if it wasn't in my box, it didn't come, and I should call UPS. 
call UPS, and they insist that if the tracking number says it was delivered, it was delivered. After several minutes of arguing, they tell me to check with the mailroom again. So I did. The lady goes to the loading dock to check. I'm not convinced she actually did and comes back several minutes later empty-handed. Now I care less about the game and more about what is apparently a lost package, so I'm venting to my roommate about it. He asks me for the number at UPS and gives them a call. I overheard half of a sob story about how he needs this textbook to study for a test. He ordered it overnight shipped. The tracking says it's delivered, but the mailroom can't find it. Now he's going to fail, on and on. UPS actually called the driver, who was apparently new, and he said no one was around to sign for the overnight packages, so he left them off to the side at the loading dock. Back at the mailroom, the lady is obviously annoyed to see me again. We tell her what UPS said, and she says she'll look again tomorrow, since they're about to close for the day. I double down on the textbook story, and she goes to look, probably for real this time. Lo and behold, she returns with my box and a couple others of the same shape and size, probably fellow World of Warcraft enthusiasts. Apparently, the driver left them in completely the wrong place, which is why she never found them. I spent the remainder of the evening and much of the early morning hours studying with my new book. Story 4. Nurses here will recognize this one. Once I was dealing with an extremely agitated and fearful Alzheimer's patient who had been sundowning since 3 p.m., Sundowning is an occurrence in some Alzheimer's patients where their mental function gets worse and worse as the day goes on or once it starts to get dark. Anywho, this sweet old lady was having an absolute fit. All through my shift, night shift, yay, I was running in and out of her room. The bed alarm keeps going off. She was so confused, afraid. I desperately wanted her to go to sleep. Mind you, I had seven other patients. I finally walk her out to the nurse's station and plop her down in a seat next to me while I do my charting. She's yelling at me and throwing things. I've had it at this point, and I'm running out of ideas. I finally look at her and say, How will I ever finish with the wash? My husband will be so mad when he gets home. Would you help me finish? She looks me right in the eye, clear as day, and says, Dang it, sister, don't you ever learn. Give me that laundry. (laughs) so I grab a stack of folded towels and mess them up really quick and plop them in front of her. She folded all of them. I would say, oh, look at that. She turned around and I would mess the towels up again. This went on a few times until the sweet lady just passed out, exhausted from being so worked up earlier, and maybe from all the towel folding. I slowly pushed her in the desk chair down the hall and gently get her back into bed. She started to wake up and I leaned down and whispered, All the wash is done. You have nothing else to worry about. She slept throughout the night. We were both happy. I am the grandma whisperer. My dad used to be a nurse. He said, shh, the baby's sleeping. Works 90% of the time on Alzheimer's patients. Story 5. My sister was hospitalized at four years old for a buildup of fluid in her head. She refused to drink any of the milk being offered by the hospital because it didn't have the cow and sunglasses on the side of the box that the other hospital's milk had. Her being a sick child in for literal brain surgery, the hospital went above and beyond, sending someone to the local grocery store to try and find this milk brand with the cow wearing sunglasses. When they never found it, I googled the image, asked if they had a printer, and taped the cow to the side of their milk carton. I still think it's adorable that it worked. When I was a social worker, I had a developmentally disabled client who was obsessed with light bulbs. It was to the point where he had to plan to go to the store weekly to buy him a new bulb to install in one of his lamps. If we didn't get him his fix, he'd start breaking bulbs to force the issue. So I took him one week and bought him a cheap, generic bulb. The image on the carton was just a plain outline of a light bulb, but my client started freaking out that the bulb was wrong because there were words printed on the top of the bulb itself, unlike the picture, wattage, etc., He started escalating really quickly, swearing and threatening, and generally leading down a path to having to call the police. I was at the end of my rope trying to explain the discrepancy, grabbed a pen, and drew in the words on the carton's label. It was like an off switch for his anger, and the rest of the day was a blast. Sometimes people's expectations are simultaneously way more important and vastly easier to meet than we believe. I hope your sister's hospitalization went well, and she enjoyed her milk. Being aware that something is wrong, but being mentally incapable of correcting the problem sounds like heck. Story 6. I've got a buddy that designs mainframes, and he's also an avid gamer. 
For years, he'd just build a new gaming PC if any part of his failed, and he'd give me the old system to fix up because it'd be a huge upgrade for me for the price of whatever broke, plus swapping in an HDD. Hard disk drive. This particular system's GPU failed, so he gave me that one and ordered parts to build a new system. A few nights later, he called me because he can't get the new system to do anything and asked me if I could bring the old system back to use it to test out his new parts. I pack everything up and head over. When I arrive, he's got it stripped down to PSU, CPU, motherboard, and RAM. Hitting the power button did absolutely nothing, so he was thinking it was a defective PSU, but asked what I thought. I started thinking of the circuit the power takes and asked if he tested the power button. It was a new case too, and he was completely shocked at the thought that the button might not work. I pulled the power jumper from the board, shorted the pins with my car key, and it booted right up. One of the wires for the button wasn't soldered in properly, and the solder joint cracked. So you started a computer with a car key? Got it. Story 7. Thumb butt program director of our hospital decided for patient safety there should be no abbreviations in patients' charts and records. That goes for TURB T, LAV H, surgical jargons that don't make sense to lay people. Which kind of makes sense, I guess. Then he went overboard and started to ask everyone to write out full names for cancer markers and lab data and their units. It worked. He was let go. In the UK, people are legally entitled to be able to view their own medical records if they request it. This panicked quite a few medical professionals. If you ever see older medical records from just before this time, you'll see stuff like TTFO, which stands for Told to Go Away, MFC, Measure for Coffin, and NFC, Normal for Cornwall, can be adapted to the location. I just like the rhyme. Most of it is pretty specific to the area and tends to be little in-jokes among the local health professionals. In my own place of work, I once saw a light bulb drawn in the corner of the page. When I asked what it meant, I was told this particular health professional used that to warn his colleagues the person was a bit dim. Story 8. Drove to a neighboring town 80 miles away with one burned-out headlight. Remaining headlight went out while in said town. I had no money, and shops were closed regardless. These were dual beams, so although I had lost both headlights, the high beams worked. I didn't make it out of town without getting honked at and flashed repeatedly by angry passing motorists, and understandably so. What was I to do? I continued down the highway and made it about 15 miles before I'm pulled over by the first officer to see me. I explained the situation. Officer has no suggestions. This was before cell phones. Tells me I can go, but that I won't make it home without getting stopped again. I pull over at the next exit, get free water, dump it in the dirt, make a thin mud, and smear it over my lights. Worked like a charm. No more honks or flashes. Passed multiple officers. My dad had a similar issue once. A light on the back of his boat trailer went out, so he just duct-taped a flashlight in a red Solo cup to the back. Story 9. I once owned a Subaru and drove a half hour away to a friend's house. On the way home, the brakes lost all their fluid. When I stepped on the brake pedal, the car just coasted. This was in the middle of a blizzard. Nobody else was on the road, so in my head, it made the most logical sense to drive it home right then and there, rather than wait for a tow truck during a blizzard. I took back roads and stayed in first or second gear, 20 miles per hour at most, and braked to a stop with the emergency brake. It was really easy in retrospect. Dumb, but easy. That's why it's called an emergency brake. It relies on a cable, so when your car's hydraulic brake system fails, you can still slow to stop. Takes a lot longer. Only point this out because I've actually heard people say they thought emergency brake meant use in case of emergency. Like, uh-oh, an accident happened in front of me, and I need to stop instantly. Pull e-brake. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of this video, and have a wonderful day. Story 10. I was at a hotel on a floor close to the top, but not at the top. There were many people leaving from the levels above, and as a result, it would take about three minutes or so for one person from our level to get onto the elevator. There was also a guy with a cart loaded with giant suitcases attempting to go down and would not let anyone else who could potentially be able to fit onto the elevator get on. I had to leave within a few minutes, or I would miss the bus, which was heading to the airport, and thus miss the plane. I proposed the stupid idea of going up, as everyone was waiting for the elevator to go down, and from there, we would be able to skip the queue and go all the way down. It worked. 
and luckily it did not stop at the original floor we were on, as the guy with the cart would probably not be so happy. Story 11. My car got pummeled in a terrible hailstorm, little dents over every surface of the car. My insurance would only write it off as a total loss, and I didn't want to give up the car. A friend pointed out that since I live in the desert, the heat will likely fix a lot of those dents over time. That's exactly what happened. A year later, you had to look carefully to find dents where there used to be a hundred of them. Ignoring the problem fixed it. Should let them write it off as a total loss, and then buy it back from them as a salvage title for like $500. You'd never be able to sell it again, but you'd already have the money, and it sounds like you wanted to keep it. My insurance company offered me two deals. Total loss, forfeit car. And total loss, keep the car. I thought that was standard. Looks like you chose the life isn't fair plan. Story 12. One of my friends is a teacher, and he was finding it hard to deal with his kids dabbing in class. So, he started doing it, in a super white dude awkwardly trying to fit in with no rhythm way. The kids stopped. Who knew that the way to get kids to stop doing drugs is to have the nerdy teachers do drugs? Started using the word low-key after every other word, which annoyed the heck out of my students. Two days, and everyone stopped using it, at least in my classes. I was subbing a while ago, and I told a group of 7th graders something like, Okay, everyone settle down. Just be cool and do your work, and we'll have a nice, low-key math class. They freaked out. Oh my god, you said low-key. Teachers don't say that. And that was how I became an old person who's irrationally irritated with kids these days. Story 13. I couldn't connect to the Wi-Fi. My Wi-Fi adapter wasn't working right and wouldn't connect to anything. So I right-clicked on the adapter in the control panel, clicked Diagnose, and Windows fixed it automatically. Only time I've seen it work. Hold on to this experiment for the rest of your life. It may never happen again. Windows 10? They changed the way it fixes things and will now do everything it needs to do to fix it, up to the point of completely reinstalling Windows. It's been a godsend to just tell my mother to make Windows solve all her problems. Networking isn't the only place I've seen the Windows diagnose and fix tool work and work relatively consistently. That's because all it does is turn it off and turn it back on again, by disabling and re-enabling it. Story 14. Back when I was in sixth form at school, we had new sofas in the common room, a room where our year could hang out and relax, work, listen to music on our time off. They had been there only a couple of days before one of the legs snapped off one of the sofas. Now we could have attempted to fix it, or just left it missing a leg, but there were often checks and cleaners moving furniture who would have noticed it was broken, and we would have gotten in trouble for not respecting school property. So we did the only sensible thing, which was break all the legs off the sofa, and then all the sofas in the room so that they were all the same height. We stashed the legs in the ceiling, and nobody knew a thing. Story 15. Getting on to the New Jersey Turnpike once, there was an attendant at each booth handing out something to each driver. I assumed that meant the machines that issue tickets indicating where you got on were broken, Turns out they were handing out pamphlets advertising Easy Pass, and I had skipped the functioning ticket machine. By turnpike rules, I would have to pay the full fee, as though I had driven the entire length. As I approached my exit, I came up with a stupid plan. Act stupid. When I pulled up to the toll booth window, I said, against every grammatical fiber in my being, Um, I ain't got no ticket. The attendant rolled her eyes and asked where I had entered. Playing dumb saved me about five dollars. Story 16. There was a nursing home in Germany, and the patients with dementia kept wandering off. They installed a fake bus stop in front of the nursing home, so when dementia patients got out of the building, they would go sit at the fake bus stop and wait for the non-existent bus. The bus stop was clearly visible from the main offices, so whenever staff saw someone out there, they would just go and retrieve them. Solve the problem completely. Dementia wards in hospitals in New England, USA, are pretty common to have something like a bookcase painted over the doors to prevent the same sort of thing. No, it's not a fire hazard. Any mentally competent person can discern it is a door. Story 17. Back in the day, hitting a TV or other appliance to make it work. Heck, even today it still works sometimes. Percussive maintenance. It's a standard in IT. Also works on OSI Layer 8. I used to work for DirecTV, and I got a phone call from Henry Winkler's house. It was a really easy fix. 
I just had to resend authorizations on my end for a service expired message because he rarely used this guest room. But I was able to talk him into hitting it, and then I resent the authorizations, and it came back on. And he was like, hey. I told him what I did, but he thought it was funny. I don't care if this is true. I like this story. Story 18. I called about a pothole at the entrance of my store. They said since it was my entrance, I'd have to pay for it. I called back as a concerned citizen, and it'll be fixed in 72 hours. Used the wax from a baby bell cheese round to secure the license plate tucked in the back window. It was a rental, and we didn't want to scratch anything up by putting the plate on, but the racket was driving me crazy. Two chunks of wax on the corners, and I could sleep on the road trip. I also used it on my screen door in the same way, because the weather stripping was worn out and my landlord was a cheap butt. Stop the rattling. Story 19. My folks were in town, and my wife and I wanted to take them to dinner. We headed to a nearby mediocre steakhouse at the request of my parents, and it's around 6 p.m. The hostesses tell us there's a minimum 45-minute wait. I got suspicious, as their parking lot had barely any cars, so I peek around into their dining area. There are several open tables that would fit a party of four. Mildly annoyed, I ask the hostesses why we can't be seated at any of these tables. They reply that they're being held for future reservations. I get on my smartphone, open the Open Table app, make a reservation for 6.15pm for a party of four, and we are seated immediately. Story 20. My house is about 100 years old with a basement, and the basement windows are just as old. The basement window kept popping open, and they opened to the inside. I noticed there were a few leftover 20-foot pieces of wood trim never used, so I placed one end on the bottom part of the window frame, bent the trim so it bows, and stuck the other end in the corner of the wall opposite. It holds true and fits like a glove. That was four years ago, and I promised myself I'm going to fix it properly tomorrow. Sounds like you fixed it properly four years ago. If it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. Story 21. Bought a non-chargeable iPhone 5S from a second-hand store for a bargain. Used a toothpick to clean the contact. Phone is chargeable now and works perfectly. Similarly, my friend was going to throw away his old iPod mini because it didn't work anymore, and he had a new one. So I asked for it, and he gave it to me. Swapped out the charging cable for another cable, and it worked. The only broken thing was the original charger. I offered it back to him since it was never really broken, but he was kind and let me keep it since he already had a new one. Story 22. Dudes peeing absolutely everywhere in the bathroom where I once worked, so the janitor put a little red sticker in each toilet, and suddenly the problem stopped. Apparently men will aim at a target 100% of the time if a target is presented. That's why a lot of urinal brands have their logo in them. Guys will aim at the target. Though on the subject of urinals and ideas, who thought these waterless urinals were a good idea? They're great for about a year, but then they get clogged up with pee, pee and calcium, and the whole bathroom smells like stale pee, pee pee. Pee Story 23. Several months ago, I was working in an ICU when a pipe burst in the ceiling and began to leak into my patient's room. The supervisor's solution was move him into the hall. However, that would have ended the life of this particular patient. Thankfully, it had been a rainy weekend, so I propped my umbrella up on the patient and the water ran off harmlessly into the floor. The surgeon had a tiny heart attack when he saw it a bit later, but he got over it, I suppose. Probably in the right place for a heart attack anyhow. Story 24. Our family cat hated our family dog. We rubbed the dog all over with fresh catnip. New best friends. And here I am now wondering if I could befriend a lion doing this. Next year's Darwin Award nominee right here. Something similar. We had a problem with my dog just trashing all of her toys as soon as she got them, so we put a stuffed rabbit or something in a bin with dirty laundry. She loved that rabbit because it smelled like us. Never destroyed it, just carried it around. Story 25. I was in college with a real awful set of hand-me-down kitchen utensils. I had my heart set on making almond-crusted fish for dinner one night, but had no feasible way of crushing the almonds with the shoot knives in my drawer, so I put them in a plastic bag and wrapped them in a dish towel and ran them over with my SUV a few times in the parking lot. Voila, the fish came out great. You had an SUV but no rolling pin or heavy books? Story 28. Restarting a computer does so much. And phones. My sister had an issue with her phone overheating, 
Turns out she had never closed an app ever and never turned the thing off. She used it all night for a sleep tracking app and all day because she was a teenager. I force closed all the apps and restarted it. It was like new. Smartphones are incredibly tough when you consider the amount of use we get out of them. Story 27. I'm really late to this, but in my ecology class, we learned about how there's a snake problem in Guam, particularly brown tree snakes. The solution? Dropping unalive mice laced with Tylenol attached to tiny streamer cardboard parachutes. Tylenol is poisonous to the snakes, and the streamers attract their attention. It worked. The snakes ate the mice and it mitigated the snake problem that was affecting the native bird species. I was tested on this in my final exam. Story 28. Wrapping your Xbox 360 in a towel and leaving it turned on caused some of the poopy connections on wiring to resolve themselves if you had the ring of death. Something daft like that anyway. I fixed the HDMI ports on one of my TVs by baking the motherboard in the oven. Yeah, when the towel trick stopped working on my 360, I started to put it in the oven for a bit instead. Story 29. When applying for college, they never sent me my student ID with my student number and everything I needed. I called in and they made a big deal about having to fill out forms and get approval from someone and all sorts of BS, so I just walked into the front desk and said I lost it. They printed a new ID and gave me my number right then on the spot. Story 30. My stepdad was taking a sat nav back to the shop as it was acting strange, but the bloke serving him refused to take it as the warranty only covers physical damage, not accidental damage. So he just drop kicked it lightly and the bloke just casually said, that'll do sir, and went out back to get a replacement. Wasn't too sure what to think about that. Story 31. Blowing into a Nintendo cartridge to get the game to work. I had a friend in college who would blow into the cartridge and then slam it into the N64 as hard as possible, because it worked better that way. He ended up breaking a console doing it. Story 32. A tick crawled into the headphone jack of my phone. The next two searches on my phone were, what eats ticks? Guinea hen mating noises. After about 15 seconds of female guinea hen sounds, the tick crawled out of my phone. Genius. Story 33. Stabbing yourself in the leg with a pen to get out of a horribly boring sales meeting. Stab someone else to get out of every meeting. Story 34. Tapping on the guidance computer during the Apollo 11 moon landing. Story 35. Kicking the vending machine whose product is stuck. Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.